All right. Hello and welcome to our session, The Role of Trauma-Informed Supervision in Ending the Epidemic. We have about an hour together today, so we'll spend the first 20 minutes or so setting the stage for the need of trauma-informed supervision and outlining what trauma-informed supervision is and why it's important. Um, we will then spend the last um, 20 or 30 minutes or so discussing strategies for practicing trauma-informed supervision in your respective environments. Um, so with that, let's get started. Uh, my name is Katie McCormick. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm joined by my colleague, Yadira Aguilar, whose pronouns are also she, her, and hers. Um, we are both part of the Sustain Wellbeing Compass Coordinating Center out of the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. Um, and we are funded by Gilead Sciences. So just wanted to disclose that from the beginning. Before we dive into our content, we want to quickly note our learning outcomes for today's presentation. So by the end of the presentation, participants will be able to identify and list the principles of trauma-informed care, describe the core components of trauma-informed supervision, and apply their connection to trauma-informed care principles and apply and integrate trauma-informed supervision strategies in your respective environments. Um, we also want to note that while some of this information will be specific to the deep U.S. South, um, however, trauma-informed supervision can be applied within any context or setting. Um, so we encourage you to keep that in mind as we move throughout the presentation today. So Yadira and I are two members of a mighty team. Um, Sustain is led by Dr. Samir Ali. And while each team member is integral to our work, um, we want to specifically highlight our sustained advocacy group. Um, and this is a group of seven openly disclosed people living with HIV that live across the deep U.S. South um, and who regularly inform and shape the work of our center. So back to Sustain. Um, Sustain is one of three Compass Coordinating Centers as funded by the Gilead Compass Initiative. Um, the two other centers are the Emory, Emory Rollins School of Public Health in Atlanta, Georgia, and the Southern AIDS Coalition in Birmingham, Alabama. Each center aims to build organizational capacity in different content areas. Sustain focuses specifically on mental health, trauma-informed care, substance use and harm reduction, and wellness. Um, and we do this in many ways, namely through collaborative learning environments, grants and free training and consultation. All of our work is focused in the nine deep south states, which include Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. So really the Gulf Coast Southeast region. Um, and Sustain is guided by a set of core values that inform all of our work. Um, so the first of which is NEPA, or the Meaningful Involvement of People Living with HIV. Um, we recognize that uh, the meaningful involvement of people living with HIV in all levels of the initiative and aim to ensure that people living with and most impacted by HIV are involved in every level of decision making. The second is inter intersectionality and social justice, emphasizing racial justice. Um, so we recognize that social privilege and oppression influence access to and allocation of resources. We affirm the importance of advancing justice by increasing access to resources and services among groups disproportionately impacted by HIV. The third is openness, transparency, and learning. Um, so we strive to demonstrate and promote a culture of integrity. Our commitments to openness, transparency, and learning jointly express values that are vital to our work. Um, because our work, both internally and externally, is situated in complex institutional and cultural environments. We can't achieve our goals without being adaptive learning organizations, and we cannot be such an organization unless we're open and transparent. And then the last is collaboration and commitment. Um, we base our collaborative efforts on mutual respect and mutual support, both internally and externally. In our commitment to developing trusting relationships, we aspire to treat everyone who works with us with respect and understanding, and we are committed to collaborating with and serving communities and areas with the greatest needs. 
Um, so I just wanted to name these from the beginning. Um, you may notice these, value, these values permeating throughout our presentation, um, and we invite you to practice them throughout our time together. So to set the stage for our workshop today, we first wanted to discuss our context. Um, some of you may have seen this before, but in case not, this is a map of HIV prevalence across the United States um, as provided by AIDSview. The darker the color, the higher the prevalence of HIV in that county. Um, and as you can see, the deep southern states are greatly impacted. In fact, the deep south accounts for 51% of new HIV diagnoses, yet only comprises 38% of the overall U.S. population. Furthermore, eight of the 10 states with the highest rates of new diagnoses are in the Deep South. The drivers of the HIV epidemic are multi-level and many-fold, which we'll take a look at next. So as HIV service providers, you may be familiar with the socio-ecological model, which articulates the multi-level and interconnected factors that influence individuals. Here, we're looking at the socio-ecological model in the context of HIV. Um, so obviously, examples are going to be specific to this landscape. This diagram here defines examples of each level and demonstrates the interconnected nature of levels. So starting with the outermost um, pinkish red circle, um, macro level systems and policies, such as um, ending the HIV, ending the epidemic plans and brian white funding trickle down and influence communities and organizations like federally qualified health centers aid service organizations community-based organizations all um, of which provide services and directly work with people living with hiv um, so we just wanted to reiterate that um, that systems and policies trickle down and impact individuals now, with this framework in mind, let's talk through Medicaid expansion as an example. Um, lack of Medicaid coverage leaves many people uninsured with decreased access to affordable health care. Um, and we know that those most impacted by the Medicaid gap are also those most impacted by HIV, for example, Black and Latinx transgender communities. Um, this forces uninsured individuals to seek health care from community-based entities like aid service organizations and federally qualified health centers, thus putting more of a burden on these communities, on these community entities, I'm sorry, um, to, to fill the gap in care. And as you can see from this map, only one deep south state, Louisiana, has expanded Medicaid. And so as you can imagine, many individuals throughout the deep south are seeking care from their local community organizations. As mentioned, and as you may know from your own experiences, the impact of policies are far-reaching. Most notably, policies impact funding priorities and the distribution of funding, thus minimizing resources, creating understaffed organizations, and cumbersome caseloads for existing staff. Ultimately, inhibiting the delivery of quality care to people living with HIV. We want to reiterate that this is all due to structural factors, not individual staff or organizations. And again, these factors are not necessarily exclusive to the South, but they're certainly exacerbated in the South due to the socio-political context, among other things. Um, an example of this is the quote unquote bootstrap mentality, um, which emphasizes an individual's responsibility in say, suppressing their viral load um, while ignoring factors like policies, funding and stigma that cause organizations that provide needed care to be understaffed, overburdened and inaccessible. Furthermore, we want to highlight the trickle down impact of policies on organizational staff. Increased caseloads and responsibilities combined with decreased resources often result in burnout, turnover, and compassion fatigue among frontline workers who provide services to people living with HIV. This then ripples out to poor quality care for clients as well as client dissatisfaction. And again, these factors are not necessarily exclusive to the South, but are exacerbated in the South. So in summary, in order to end the HIV epidemic, we must consider the impact of organizational environments that service providers are a part of. We must also create effective strategies and interventions to build healthy, trauma-informed environments. 
Trauma-informed supervision is one such strategy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Yadira, who can describe what it is, why it's important, and how we can practice it in our own settings. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> so um, let's move to the next slide. Yeah. So um, the trauma-informed supervision is part of a larger strategy to implementing trauma-informed care. So before we go into trauma-informed supervision, I would like to review some of those key concepts for trauma-informed care. So a, a trauma-informed approach, or also known as trauma-informed care, can be implemented in any type of uh, service setting, any organization, and it is distinct for, from trauma-specific interventions or treatments, um, for example, like trauma-focused CBT or any other form of uh, trauma-focused therapy or intervention. Um, but I do want to add that that trauma-informed care also supports and it's inclusive of these trauma-informed or focused um, trauma-focused interventions, and if that is something that your organization provides. So again, um, it is an organizational approach that ideally requires leadership buy-in and support from everyone involved in the organization, uh, from frontline staff, um, including receptionists, security guards, program directors, supervisors, chief officers, so everyone within the organization. Uh, but trauma-informed care is also multi-level, and anyone in any role has the ability to apply this approach. Um, specific to management and supervisors, you definitely have influence and the ability to begin to implement this approach in this in, in the work that you do. And so you're moving the organization along that trauma-informed continuum because trauma-informed care is ongoing and it does unfold over time. So with this approach, um, there is a shift in knowledge, perspective, perspectives, skills, and attitudes. Trauma-informed care realizes the pervasiveness of trauma. It recognizes the signs and symptoms, responds to trauma, and resists re-traumatization. So there is this shift in focus. We're moving away from the question of what's wrong with you, and instead we're asking what happened to you. Next slide, please. So, with um, trauma-informed care, there's no special manual or prescribed set of practices or procedures for following um, this approach. But there are six principles that a program or organization can adhere to. The, these six principles are trustworthiness and transparency, collaboration and mutuality, peer support, cultural, historical, and gender factors, empowerment, voice, and choice, and then finally, safety. You'll find that these principles are often interconnected, um, especially with the safety principle. So you can see it here at the bottom stretched out across all other principles. So there's six. Now, um, one thing to remember about trauma-informed care is that you must be intentional about this approach. So, so I think it's very important to understand the reasons why these principles are essential to trauma-informed care in order to stay intentional and true to this approach. So, so why these principles? If we think about trauma, whether it was a single event or multiple traumatic events, and you think about what someone feels during something traumatic, uh, for example, receiving an HIV diagnosis, we know that that can be um, a traumatic situation for someone. Um, so if you think about what someone feels, um, they often, people often feel powerless, feel hopeless, feel helpless, and, and, and very terrified. Same or similar feelings go for someone in a car accident um, or someone going through a natural disaster, human trafficking, and domestic violence. So in trauma-informed care, we're using these principles to, to go against or contradict these beliefs of powerlessness, hopelessness, and this is done by adhering to this set of principles to guide your work um, in a, in a trauma-informed approach. People with, uh, with unresolved trauma um, need to feel safe, they need to feel heard, they need to feel or they need to be offered hope. Clients need to know that and that you understand clients and staff really need to understand that you that 
or need to know that you understand their culture, their backgrounds, their identities, um, and they need to feel that they are the ones in control over the lives, over their lives, and, and you're simply there to support them and to collaborate with them um, to get to help them get their needs met. So same thing goes for trauma-informed supervision. There's no special checklist of items that need to be met in order to be a trauma-informed supervisor. Instead, you're using these six principles to guide your work and as your role and your role as a supervisor. Next slide, please. So again, trauma-informed supervision is one part of a larger strategy to implementing trauma-informed care. So here we have these larger pieces um, to the puzzle and, and trauma-informed supervision is one of them along with physical environments, policies and procedures, trauma-specific services, staff care, and then staff training. Um, so supervisors are in a, a unique position to influence work culture and help their organization move along that trauma-informed continuum through trauma-informed supervision. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So as mentioned, trauma-informed supervision aligns with principles and common practices of trauma-informed care. So, so what is trauma-informed supervision? These are some key concepts. As a trauma-informed supervisor, you recognize the hard stories that many staff members are exposed to when they hear clients' trauma stories and become witnesses to the pain and fear that trauma survivors have endured. And this um, often it's um, not just social workers working with clients, but also maybe intake specialists, receptionists who are helping individuals schedule um, their appointments. And then also more specifically, we know that people living with HIV are often part of marginalized communities or groups who have experienced historical or intergenerational trauma and oppression on top of sti the stigma that's associated with HIV. So, so a trauma-informed su su through some sorry su through trauma-informed supervision, um, it, it emphasizes supporting staff members and it encourages self-care. Um, trauma-informed supervision is also relationship and motivational interviewing based. Staff should feel cared for as a person by their supervisor, and we see this happen through honest communication and transparency. It is also strengths-based in both attitudes and language. This can be reflected in those corrective action conversations between supervisor and staff. A trauma-informed supervisor, supervisor always assumes that staff are, are doing the best they can. Um, and I wanna add that with COVID and, and this COVID pandemic, um, this may be an appropriate time to reflect on these key concepts. How have you been applying these concepts as you've had to support staff in their transitions to work from home? And then all other sudden changes that happened um, pretty quickly. And so um, also, what about the most recent events around racial injustices and pr police brutality in, in our country? Did you hold space for staff, especially black staff members? Um, and the, did you do some for, form of um, check-in with, with staff during these, these weeks? So think about these key concepts and how you've been applying these or maybe uh, which of these concepts you need to work on a little bit more as we move on through this presentation. Next slide, please. So why is trauma-informed supervision? Well, it increases staff satisfaction, it promotes staff retention, decreases burnout and staff turnover, negates vicarious trauma, enhances staff well-being, and then improves services provided to clients. So again, trauma-informed supervision helps your organization move along that continuum. Um, so it's, it's a win-win for both um, staff and clients. Next slide, please. So before we get into examples of how we can apply these principles in a supervisory management role, I wanna remind you of that influence I mentioned earlier, the influence that a supervisor brings to the culture of an organization via the various hats a supervisor wears on a daily. So supervisors are problem solvers, mentors, educators, role models, 
role models, uh, feedback givers, they inspire and they often set the tone. Um, so here are the six principles again. Um, so think about how do you practice these principles um, via wearing these various hats as a supervisor. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off with the safety principle in, in trauma-informed supervision. Some of these character, characteristics that um, are that it's relationship-oriented, it's learning-focused, it's feedback-oriented, and there's mutual accountability for this um, principle. And then these characteristics are manifested through offering a safe and welcoming environment um, to staff, being consistent and predictable, using non-shaming, non-blaming, non-violent language um, as you, in your interactions with staff members. And then you're clear in expectations and you value and support self-care. And so let's talk about some examples. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> These are just some examples. Again, um, this is just to kind of, um, get you started thinking about how to apply the safety principle in the work that you do as a supervisor. Um, there are many other ways to use this, uh, this, this principle, um, but here are some examples. Um, one of them could be um, being clear about providing a safe and brave space for staff to voice their concerns and ideas. Again, um, it's strength-based, so we're not just um, letting staff members know, bring a problem to me. We're also um, saying bring solutions to me. Um, we are open um, to hearing your ideas about how to improve the work that we do um, in the organization. Um, set regular times, set regular meeting times and inform your staff what the meeting is about so they can come prepared and, and not just simply saying, sending out a quick email last minute saying, hey, we're meeting in five minutes. Um, so try to Try to be regular with time, meeting times and, and then inform your, your staff about what the meeting is about. Also, address staff concerns privately rather than in a group setting. Focus on solutions rather than the problem. Um, when policies and processes change, explain to staff why those changes have been implemented. And always do that with time. If, if you know that there's a, a change, a, a major change coming down the pipeline, inform your staff that these are, that there's some things that may be changing, and then obviously reasons why. And next slide, that is you, Katie. <laughs> there we go. Um, so moving on to the next trauma-informed care principle of collaboration and mutuality. Um, so this principle embodies open and honest communication, consistency, inclusive speech, like we and us instead of you or I. Um, and it's also feedback oriented. So in practice, this can take many forms, but should typically center respect, connection, and hope. Um, shared decision making, so you're working with staff instead of um, staff working as individuals. Um, it's also the leveling of power differences. Um, and this principle also recognizes that healing occurs within interpersonal relationships and that everyone has a role to play. So really here, the theme is, um, you know, it, it's more team oriented, right? People aren't doing things by themselves in silos. Um, now, specific to your practice settings, collaboration and mutuality can look like regular check-ins with staff, just asking how they're doing as a person. Um, so starting off the meeting by asking how people are doing um, and if there's anything that they need from you as a supervisor. Um, this can also look like supporting staff on making decisions in complex client cases. Um, I think we've all had <laughs> A handful of clients that can be really difficult um, it, and it can be hard to, to manage those cases so it's particularly important that supervisors are available to support um, also along those lines is setting aside time to debrief with staff on major incidents or on those complex cases so again just being available um, they may not take you up on it um, but that's on them your role is to just be available and offer that support and then lastly, similar to what Yudira had just mentioned, is listening to staff ideas and supporting these changes when possible. Um, and also advocating on behalf of your team with leadership if there are um, higher up leadership above you.
sorry, I was muted, <laughs> uh, with this principle of trust and transparency. Um, with this, we have the correct characteristics are clear expectations. Again, that open and honest communication between supervisors and staff. Um, it's relationship oriented, again, mutual accountability. And how you'll see this um, is through uh, building and maintaining trust among your staff um, and clients, maintain professional boundaries. Again, you're the role model for staff. Um, so maintaining those professional boundaries between staff and then also clients, um, ensuring policies and processes are transparent. Um, so asking, asking staff members, you know, if they once they review those policies and procedures, is there anything that they don't understand or need some clarity around um, certain areas? Um, it's also um, informed consent grieving process also, you know, helping uh, staff members understand that chain of command and if they there's ever a problem who to take the problem to whether it's you directly or HR. Um, and then assumes people um, are doing the best they can. Again, you're assuming that staff are doing the best they can. Um, and so you're understanding um, when, in, when Katie talked about collaboration, you're also um, kind of being aware of um, when, when client is dealing or a staff member is dealing with a, a complex case, understanding when there may be a problem and in, 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 um, maybe the staff member is getting um, a little irritated or just confused. Um, so knowing those those cues and then supporting them um, during that process. Um, but again, assuming that they're doing the best they can. And then some examples are, um, again, be transparent with staff, explain why you're rescheduling a meeting, um, explain professional boundaries to staff and, and do so early on. Um, review policies and procedures with staff and ensure they understand, encouraging them to ask questions. Um, and then be clear about who is responsible for what and what time frame, especially on collaborative projects. Anything else you would add to this, Katie? Feel free to chime in. Yeah, nothing to add. Um, I will say, though, that these are just examples, right? These are just meant to kind of get your gears working um, to help prompt your thinking. This is not an exhaustive list. If you're interested in, in more examples about how you can apply this in your setting, reach out. We have a really great infographic one pager that has a more exhaustive list. But again, these are just prompts. So just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Um, so moving on to the next trauma-informed care principle that aligns with trauma-informed supervision, um, it's empowerment, voice, and choice. So this principle is often embodied through a shared vision. Um, so back to that like team-based approach, um, it's strength-based. Strength um, so always seeking, um, believing that people are doing the best that they can. Um, this approach also offers um, choices and provides tools and resources. Um, so in practice, this can look like supervising to strengths, um, using those strengths to build co healthy coping skills. This principle also values one's social roles and promotes choices and individual autonomy in their work. And then also frames traumatic experiences in terms of survivorship and not victimization. Um, so a great example of this that Yadira and I have, have learned to reframe is um, instead of a victim of human trafficking, it's a survivor of human trafficking. Um, and in the context of HIV, you know, this can be a person living with HIV rather than an HIV positive person or, um, you know, someone diagnosed with HIV. So it's really centering that person first. And then in terms of your specific practice settings, this can look like celebrating um, success with your staff, um, specifically with clients. Like if, if their client reached a milestone and they've been working together for an extended period of time, celebrate with that, with that staff member. Um, they've put a lot of work into that, that case um, and you know they deserve to be celebrated. Um, this can also look like learning your staff's self-care strategies and encouraging staff to practice them. Um, you know, so this requires asking. So it's important to ask your staff, you know, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Um, and then, you know, sometimes that can be helping them brainstorm what could be um, helpful to them. 
And one piece here that's not quite noted is that as a supervisor, you have to model some of these things, right? That's particularly important with self-care. So if you're not taking care of yourself, your staff sees that, um, even if it goes unsaid, they, they do see that. So it's important that you think about this for yourself as well. Um, so on the last slide, we mentioned social roles. Um, so it's important as supervisors to understand that staff you know, have lives outside of work. They're not only their professional self that present in the office. Um, so an example could be allowing a staff member to come in late um, so that they can att attend their child's event at school. You know, there's a host of examples that this can apply to, but just want y'all to know, and you know this already, but just want to reiterate that staff are more than um, the professional, professional person showing up to the office every day um, or on Zoom in our current context. Um, and then lastly is just asking questions to learn more about your staff as people. Um, so that can be, you know, what do you enjoy most about um, your day-to-day -day work activities? Uh, what part of your role is most exciting to you and why? And what are some professional goals? And, and how can you as a supervisor support? So again, those are just a few examples to get your gears turning. Yeah, so the next um, principle we have here is peer support. Again, people need to feel hope. Even as staff members, we need to feel hope. We know we need to feel that you know we're not in in this work all, all by ourselves. By ourselves, that we have colleagues and people we can rely on when things get tough. And so um, this for this particular principle, um, it monitors compassion fatigue. It recognizes that peer support and mutual Mutual self-help are key vehicles for establishing safety and hope, building trust and enhancing collaboration. So how do we use this principle in our, in our work settings? Um, so that could mean, again, checking in with staff uh, in, regarding their general well-being, offering feedback on performance, both encouragement and corrections. Um, don't shame staff for mishandling a situation. Again, going back to assuming that staff are doing the best they can. Um, and then um, use these opportunities as, as teaching opportunities. Um, debrief after complex cases, um, even um, it may also mean that you have to take over a certain case. Um, again, staff members are human being too, uh, human beings too, and there may be some unresolved trauma with staff members and specific cases may be triggering to, to staff members. So knowing when to jump in and offering that support and maybe even taking over a case. Um, and then offering healing supportive spaces during a time of crisis, for example, COVID. How were, how, what did you do to create a safe space? Um, and, and even though we're physically distancing, how were you able to let staff feel that you're there to support them during a time of crisis? Next slide. Yeah, and so the, the last trauma-informed care principle is cultural, historical, and gender factors. Um, so some common characteristics of this principle include frequent communication, consistency and flexibility, respect, validation, and affirmation, and follow-through, and also is just learning-oriented. Um, so back to what Yadira said, using opportunities um, to correct and teach your staff rather than reprimand. Um, so some manifestations of this is, um, you know, actively addressing cultural, st cultural stereotypes and biases, um, providing gender responsive services, and incorporating responsive policies and processes, which we'll get into specific examples here. Um, so in your practice settings, this um, can look like being transparent, um, so sharing your notes and document, documenting key decisions and sharing your notes with your staff so that they don't feel left out of the loop or um, guarded from, from participating. Um, listening to and considering new ideas from staff. Um, so, and also using and respecting your staff's pronouns and then also figuring out structural ways that you can integrate that, pro that practice for your clients too. Um, and then also, these, this is noted at the top, but just discussing historical traumas with staff and recognizing possible triggers in the workplace. So back to what Yadira had said, sometimes 
um, staff won't be able to may, may not recognize that something is triggering for them. It may show up in other behaviors. So as a supervisor, just be attuned to that and, and know, be aware that you may need to step in at some point if, you know, there's some frustration or some, some different behaviors um, among your staff. Anything to add here, Yudira? I was just going to add, um, also, don't assume that um, staff all know, for example, with pronouns, you know, don't assume that staff know that if you hire someone and they're new to the team that they automatically know how to um, respect and use your, your colleagues or clients' pronouns. So having those conversations and normalizing these conversations about historical trauma, intergenerational trauma right now with police brutality, this is a conversation that should be normalized in the workplace. How do we support staff members during a time like this? Um, yeah, that, that's all I had to, to add. That's me. <laughs> so again, uh, trauma-informed care, is especially trauma-informed supervision, um, they, they are inclusive uh, and supportive of self-care. Um, and so we recognize the importance of self-care. Given that trauma is complex and pervasive, it is important to take care of ourselves. Keep in mind what brings you joy and take time to do those things. Um, again, as a supervisor, you are a role model for staff. You have to model self-care practices. And this could be um, anything from just not answering your emails after 5 p.m., leaving your office for lunch, um, turning off email notifications on, during the weekends, um, sharing, and then also sharing what you did um, for self-care over the weekend with your staff. Um, that way it's intentional for you and then also um, a good example for your staff members. And I love this quote here um, by Audre Lorde, um, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation and that is an act of political war warfare. And we know that at this time with every, all the uncertainty, self-care is super, super important. Um, and that's the only way we'll, we'll be able to continue to tackle, tackle on these challenges um, in, in, in working in the fields of HIV and AIDS. Next slide. So we wanna leave you with um, a closing reflection, um, some questions to think about um, so before I, I end or we end, I want to reflect on some questions um, or some food for thought. Um, and that question is, when was the last time you experienced joy at work? What was happening at the time and, and what was the inner energy like? Who was setting the tone for you um, during this time of, um, of joy at work? Um, and then remember how you feel at work impacts how you behave, interact with colleagues and clients. Um, also, another question is, is the way you work with staff a reflection of the way leadership at your organization works with you? So think about that. Um, and then is how you're treating your staff, um, especially during a time like this, the best way what are some ways to improve? What are some of those trauma-informed supervision concepts that you can um, improve on in, in the work that you do as a supervisor or management role? And I think that's it. Katie, did you wanna add anything else? Nope. Um, no, we, we covered a lot, y'all. Um, so we just wanted to leave our contact information um, and then also, again, reiterate that if, if you're interested in seeing a more comprehensive list of opportunities to practice su trauma-informed supervision, reach out to us. Um, we're happy, we've developed these really great one-pagers that we're happy to share. Um, we think this is really important. Um, yeah, and so we're, we're happy to share this with you all. And just wanted to reiterate too that this is a practice, right? So it's not something you're going to achieve after this presentation. Um, we suggest that you take one or two things that stuck out to you that are really feasible and, and run with it. You know, keep trying and, and ask your staff for feedback. Um, yeah, just wanted to reiterate that this is a practice and there's not one toolkit that's going to get you there. Yeah, I, I always say it's, it's a good idea to even just have the six principles posted in your office somewhere because that alone uh, reminds you that if, if I'm really 
truly being intentional about being more of a, a more trauma-informed and a trauma-informed supervision supervisor, how do I apply these principles in my everyday work? And it's a good reminder to just kind of keep practicing. The more you practice, the easier it, it's the easier it is to recognize that you're already using some of these principles and then um, ways to improve. Yeah, so just a few more slides before we close. Well, one more slide before we close. Um, this is a continuing education um, presentation. So if you are seeking to receive continuing, continuing education credits or CEUs, um, please visit this website. Um, and I'm sure that it's posted within all other conference communications. Um, and that is all that we've got. Thank you all so much. Thank you.